had such a beautiful morning. But so thank you. I appreciate your interest um, to come into a cool, dark room. What I want to do is talk about what we saw the last couple of days and see if I can put this stuff together because we looked at temples, we looked at tombs, we looked at all this different stuff on the East Bank and the West Bank. And they actually fit together in a particular way. So I want to give you kind of the big view of what it was that you saw. What I also want to do is in the back of the room and in the library, I, we brought a bunch of copies of the Chicago House Bulletin, which is the bulletin for the University of Chicago's epigraphic survey. This, this is the group that's been in Luxor since 1924. And it's very interesting to read through. It gives you an idea of the kind of research that's going on in Luxor right now. So, city of Amun. Thieves. You know, it's what a place, huh? It's like so chock a block with monuments, many of them which we saw. You know, these incredible, incredible structures here at Luxor Temple that, of course, we visited. Um, here's the Ramesseum. So we drove by this, it was on the right side of the bus. Now, why is this city so important? Why is this city so jammed up with these monuments? And why are there so many temples in the city? You know, wouldn't just like one or two temples do? <laughs> but it is just full of temples, and they're jammed into this small area. So what is the relationship of all these structures? Why are they located there? Well, the rise of the city can be traced to a single factor, and that's the god Amun, who's shown here on the right side. This is Ramses' offering to Amun. And when you think of gods, you know, you think of Osiris and Isis and all that stuff, and you say, Amun, why was Amun so important? He's not really the god of love or the god of beauty or the god of power or anything like that. So who was this guy? He's kind of a slippery concept. Um, he was called the king of the gods, to give you an idea of how important he was. Um, he was, you can usually identify him, he has those two tall plumes on his head that we saw in the release. Or if you remember at Karnak Temple, remember the sphinxes with the ram heads? So he's often shown as a ram, probably a symbol of his power, but also as a man with double plumes. In Egyptian, it's kind of interesting. His name, Amun, means the hidden one. The hidden one. And so there are actually even forms of Amun called the aniconic Amun, where there's a throne with nothing seated on it, and that's the mysterious Amun. So people think maybe this idea of Amun, the hidden one, refers to his transcendence, that he is such an important god that he is everywhere. This is an interesting issue, which you interesting to talk to Ross about, this idea of transcendence in the um, Egyptian world, Amun is very closely associated with the king. And, and it's easy to say, we say no, he's associated with the king, but it's a little bit more difficult to illustrate until the new kingdom. We can see the rise of Amun. For example, the earliest kings in uh, Egypt are buried at, um, we, we were here, it's a little hard to recognize. This is the temple of Hatshepsut. This is when I was in hot air balloons, it was completely out of control. They were way too high, heading for the Western Desert, and I thought, this is it. This is it. So there's Darabakri. And you remember when we were at this temple to the left, there were the ruins of a low temple. Very important temple. That was built about 2000 BC, so 500 years before Hatshepsut. This was the big original cult center of the god Amun in the period called the Middle Kingdom. So all of this is copycat, as beautiful and elegant as it is. This is 500 years later than this. So what Hatshepsut was doing was capitalizing on the importance of this temple of her predecessor, Mentimhotep. So she looks like the big inventor, but in fact she's not. So the, the kings, early kings of the Middle Kingdom were buried at around this area, already indicating the importance of this site. And about the same time, we can see a link between the east and the west, because directly across the river, uh, here's, here's the remains of that temple we saw just to the left at Hatshepsut, at Mentumhotep. But across the river, and in fact these are geographically completely linked to each other, is the Karnak Temple. So it's clear that the east and west temples of Mentumhotep, at Darabakri, where we went, and the Karnak Temple, the core of the oldest part of the Karnak Temple, are in alignment with each other. And we can see the gradual expansion of this temple. This is the middle kingdom part of the temple. This is basically all it remains, so it's not very present. But so the middle, the oldest part of the temple is right in the middle of the temple. But what we do have this from this period are these wonderful little shrines. These are, I, I mentioned one of these to you before because 
as you know now, you've been to these temple gods like to get out of the temple, and so the statue of the god was put in a, on a boat and was carried around by the priests. And these are those shrines where the priests would stop. They'd walk up, put the boat on this pedestal, and rest. So we have a bunch of these structures from the Middle Kingdom scattered around Karnak. They were actually, it's quite interesting, they're disassembled and used as packing in later structures. So it wasn't until the early 20th century when they're starting to reinforce walls, and they started taking these walls apart and found entire buildings inside the, the, old, the, uh, the newer walls. So we know from these structures that Almun was a fertility god. Here is Almun on uh, an obelisk. Those of you, remember when we were by the Sacred Lake and there was a big section of obelisk that was lying down? This is from that, where you see Almun um, of Karnak. We know from these texts that the, there were already multiple forms of the god, which seems kind of weird to us, but there were many, many different almonds, almonds at Karnak and at Luxor. For example, at Karnak he's called King of the Gods, again an indication of his power. He's also called Lord of the Thrones of the Two Lands. So again, that's a title that's often used for the king. So they're kind of slopping back and forth between titles for the king and the god, which gives you a good idea where we're heading with this sort of association. Um, by the early 18th dynasty on the West Bank, so now we're back on the West Bank, just a little bit south of the Hatshepsut Temple is a very interesting structure at Medina Kabu. This is called the Small Temple of Amun. It was begun by probably Hatshepsut, it's about, let's say, 1500 BC, and um, it was called the, the Jesser Set, the, the holy place. All the temples in Egypt have with very specific names, which is kind of interesting, and even within a temple, each doorway has a name, each room has a name. So this was a temple built to Amun called the Holy Place of Amun. And this is now part of this structure. So here's the little temple of Amun. And to give you an idea of how holy this was thought to be, uh, 600 years later, a king builds an enormous temple here and then surrounds the whole thing with a mud brick wall. And really, the focus of this is this little temple, which later began to be called the Yat Chamut the mound of the mothers and the fathers. It was thought to be the burial place of Amun on the West Bank, along with the other great gods. So this was one of the really holy places, the burial place of Amun. But as you know already, death, life, death, life, death, life in ancient Egypt. So this is not only the burial place of Amun, but also the place where Amun and the gods were regenerated. So it was a very, very sacred place in ancient Egypt. The dominance of Amun was really complete with the building of this structure. You recognize it? This is the Luxor Temple, the middle part of it. And this is actually an ancient Egyptian, it's kind of cool. It's called the Southern Harem of Amun. Now, Harem is not really appropriate. It's basically his southern residence, his northern residence being the Karnak Temple, the first temple that we visited. And the form of Amun here is called uh, Ipatsud Amun of the Luxor Temple. And here we see many images of Amun. This is actually a later period one from the Ptolemaic period in this temple. So today in Luxor, you sort of go from temple to temple, and you often fail to see the many connections between these temples, because all of these temples, both on the East Bank and the West Bank, together created a huge network called the Domain of Amun. It's sort of like the Amun Corporation LLC. So all of this stuff belonged to Amun, and it all has very specific functions. Now, one of the interesting, very persistent misunderstandings about the Theban monuments is that they are very neatly divided west and east. And there is some truth to this. Okay, the west is the land of the dying sun, so mortuary temples are there. The east, the land of the reborn sun, so non-mortuary stuff. It's not that neat. Nothing in Egypt is that neat. For example, there were a lot of villages on the West Bank and there are a few burials, particularly the burial of Osiris himself is on the East Bank. But what we have is, you can't sort of categorize it. The Luxor and Karnak temples, remember those are on the East Bank. Those are often called festival temples. So those are the abode of the god. On the West Bank, those big temples that we saw there like Hatshepsut, those are often called mortuary temples because they was thought to be kind of the equivalent of the temple next to a pyramid. Yeah, not doesn't really work that way because now, as we see more and more texts, what we see is um, these temples, the mortuary temples, actually have a different function. So this idea 
that they were, the ones on the West Bank are mortuary temples related to the burial, which of course the burials are off in the Valley of the Kings. And people said, well, it's okay. These are, these are mortuary temples, the tombs are someplace else because they wanted to keep all the tombs together for security. So that kind of makes sense. But we do see in these temples, so this is uh, at uh, Medina and Habu, very often we see the king in the guise of Osiris. When you see a guy with the arms crossed this way, that's in the form of the mummy god Osiris. And also here at Hatshepsut, remember the temple of Hatshepsut? Above we saw a lot of these uh, largely restored, but images, image after image of Hatshepsut in the guise of Osiris. So, okay, so these might be mortuary temples. But the problem is there's absolutely no evidence that these temples on the West Bank have anything to do with the mummy of the king or the queen. Zero. We now know that the East and West Bank temples were closely tied ritually and economically to form part of a unified network of monuments dedicated to Amun and the cult of the king. And we'll see how Amun and the cult of the king go very strongly. So a lot of this has to do with the power of the king, legitimacy of the king. Because often the king expressed in these temples is Amun himself. Part of this information is from the study of the names of the temples. As I mentioned, they all have names. Um, and a few decades ago, it was noted that many of these temples on the West Bank, also on the East Bank, have this wonderful name. They're called Mansions of Millions of Years. It's called the Mansion of Millions of Years and then the specific name of this temple. And so people started saying, what's this about? Well, first they saw West Bank, fine. Mansions of Millions of Years is mortuary. But it's not that easy because it turns out that the uh, many of the, so this is the mansion of millions of years of Hatshepsut. Notice looks a little different in this photograph, a lot of restoration. I could show you 25 years of Hatshepsut's temple and it's like a you know, flip book with the amount of restoration there. Um, so on the West Bank, remember one of our first stops, the two huge statues? Okay, that's where they are. That's the temple that they stood in front of. Wow. And this is also a mansion of millions of years of King Amenhotep III. So this is basically all the remains of that temple. It's, so it worked on the West Bank, but then Egyptologists started looking on the East Bank. And oops, because Karnak is a mansion of millions of years, which doesn't, it's not, you know, you have to really think of an explanation for that. And other temples, for example, here in the first court of the Karnak Temple, when we first walked in to the left, there's this triple shrine, another mansion of millions of years. So what do these things have in common? They, what they have in common is basically a lot of shared architectural features. Most of these things have a central axis. This is where we entered the Karnak Temple, if you remember. So going into the hypostyle hall. So they have this straight line axis from the entrance to the sanctuary or the bedroom of the god. And when you start looking at the plans of these temples in Luxor, they all kind of have the same thing going on. On the, uh, the north is here. The, so the yellow are all shrines to the, to the sun god, to Ray Garanti or Horus or one of those guys. And on the, uh, on the south side, you have uh, sort of mortuary chambers but I think it's very interesting is a lot of these temples have what is called a palace attached to it. So what are palaces doing with these? These palaces are to the south. Many of these chambers also have these enormous false doors. This is a, a fake door. This is that door that allows the spirit to come and go. And these are temples, not tombs, blurring this idea of, of funerary and non-funerary. So these, these so-called palaces. This is the temple that the University of Chicago has been working on. So here we have the temple itself. This is that, um, uh, it, here is the palace right, let's see, palace is here. And it's very odd because these palaces have things like restrooms, lavatories, things that look like bedrooms. They have things that look like uh, throne rooms. And a thing that's very interesting so here's a reconstruction of the one at Medina and Habu. Beautiful structure. The thing they have in common is they have, a, they have the palace itself, and then it fronts the north side of the palace, actually abuts onto the temple, and they have what is called 
a window of appearances. So this is actually, this picture is taken inside one of the temples, looking to the south. This is essentially the doorway, or an elevated doorway to the palace. So it's a place where we thought the living king would come and show himself at the window. And people could say, oh, isn't this wonderful? And the king could, you know, admire the processions and that kind of thing. Well, we realize this really is not what's going on. Uh, what we think is actually going on is that the spirit of the king was able to forever be in this palace. So again, you've got the idea of him living on the West Bank in the land of the dead. And the idea that he could be eternally there seeing the festival processions, which we'll talk about more in just a minute. So again, this idea of east and west, this is a wonderful reconstruction of, of, of what Luxor looked like in uh, about the year uh, 1000 BC. So what we see is these temples, all these temples we went to have a shared function. They are temples of the king and of Amun. So it's not just the king, it's not Amun, it's the two of them and particularly the king as Amun, because Amun is of course eternal. And we can see this, of course, from the alignment of many of these temples. As I mentioned, Dero Bakri, the Hatshepsut temple, is perfectly aligned to Karnak. And we've got other alignments of the Luxor. This is the Luxor temple and that avenue of sphinxes, which they were excavating in Luxor, is also aligned to the West Bank temples. And what we see in these temples is scenes of the meeting of the king and Amun. This is a drawing from one of our publications. And so remember these big boats? Whenever you see these boats, remember there's a, the god, the statue of the god that lives in the temple has been put on one of these boats and is being carried around by the priests. And so what we see are these festival meetings of the bark, the boat of the god, and the boat of the king as they come together in these temples. Another important function of the temples on the West Bank is that they were places where Almon and the king physically fused. On the east bank, they're more, they're more separate. But they fuse to express the divinity of the king and to celebrate and commemorate the rejuvenation of the king. And that's really where we get the sense of a mansion of millions of years, because this idea of eternity of the king uh, as a form of the god Amun. And in fact, with some of these scenes, it gets kind of spooky, because sometimes you can't tell if you're looking at the king or Amun. For example, uh, again from our publication, here is a boat, and it has, it's a little hard to see, but it has a human face on it. So that should be the boat with a statue of the king in it. But we have the boat talking, and it says, words said by Amun Re, Lord of Eternity. So it's actually the king, but it's the voice is Amun. So here we have this complete fusion of the two, two beings. This union of the king and God also shows the linkage, particularly between the Karnak and Luxor temples, the two temples that we went to. So here we have Karnak up here, the Nile, and then the, the, the southern residence of Amun at the Luxor temple that we went to. And the guides told us about this annual festival called the Opet Festival, which was very, very important in Luxor. It was. Um, it was originally about 11 days, and then typical of Egyptian festivals, it got extended to like 24 days, so people aren't doing a whole lot of work. But that's really why this temple that we visited, the Luxor Temple, was built. This is the big focus of this temple. By the, by the reign of Amenhotep III, say roughly uh, 1300 BC, we see this very carefully shown on the walls. Remember, we went in the temple, and then there was that long row of enormous columns and this is the walls in that part of the temple. And here we see this classic scene, We've got a boat, the, the god in it, and here carried on the shoulders of priests. So what's going on during the Opet festival is um, there are various routes. Sometimes it's on land between Karnak and, and Luxor. Sometimes they go by water one way. But the whole point is, is that the statues of Amun, his wife Mut, and their child Kansu, and often the statue of the god, and by a later period, always a statue of the king, travel between these two temples. And that's why this temple was built. It's basically a reception area for the gods and the king and a place for a big festival. And in the festival, we see, um, again, these bark 
scenes, and we see that the scenes of musicians and dancers and the soldiers and everybody turning out, everybody in town turning out in their nicest, newest clothing to celebrate this procession. Because going between the two temples, of course, everybody could see the stuff. And so it was a, people would follow along. It was a kind of tremendous celebration. And here's some of the some of the musicians and soldiers. Here we have people with clap sticks beating them together like uh, like uh, marionettes. I don't know what are they called, but you know, but clap sticks. Yeah, clap stick. Yeah. And so here we have the Luxor Temple. This is where we entered the Luxor Temple. So the barks of the gods and the king come in this way, and then they start splitting off. And some of these boats are parked here and here, but then the the statue of the king and Amun go all the way. To the sanctuary and that's when those two beings merge and what we see are very interesting statues and reliefs this is a statue that was excavated from underneath the Luxor temple and here like how much more explicit can you get than this this is obviously Amun with the two big plumes this is the king look what's going on here the king is actually nestled against the, the god and the god is placing his hand on the head of the king so again this sort of union of the two beings or at least a big show of support and then we see very interesting things. For example, this is, I'm sorry, it's not a good photograph, but at the Luxor Temple, very much like at the Hatshepsut Temple, there's this idea of the divinity of the king being proclaimed. Because here we have the king Amenhotep III, who built most of the Luxor Temple. And here it shows him being his mother, having a very discreet intercourse with the god Amun. Their knees are touching. <laughs> and so then he's claiming, this king is claiming that he is actually the son of Amun. So it's not only, so there are all sorts of ways that they're expressing this. These scenes of the divine union, union are really wonderful because they claim, also at Hatshepsut, yeah, I don't know if the guys mentioned Hatshepsut, yeah, Hatshepsut's temple, there is a scene also of her mother, Ahmosa, having very discreet sex with the god Amun. And in these texts, it says that the queen thought it was her husband, but he smelled better. Yeah. Yeah. There was this odor of incense and stuff, and it's like, ooh, apparently quite pleasurable. But so we have a lot of these kings and queens saying, not only am I associated with Amun, but I am actually his son or daughter in the case of Hatshepsut. And then in the Luxor Temple, we, in, toward the back of the temple, there are these really wonderful scenes that get really, really wiggy. And this is where Egyptologists are kind of a necessity because you have to be able to read this stuff. What we start seeing are scenes of the king, shown on the left, offering to himself, also shown on, shown on the right. And so what we have is the king becoming Amu and offering to himself. And there are wonderful scenes, and the Egyptians loved puns. The Egyptian language was very rich in puns. So one of the great scenes, by the way, this is a fabulous scene of him. These are musical instruments. They're ritual rattles called sister. Um, in one of these scenes, the, uh, the king is giving to himself incense. And the word for incense in ancient Egyptian is senetur. Well, the word to become a god is senetur. So they're doing these wonderful puns as he's giving incense to his deified self. So this union of the king and the god are expressed also in other rituals that created this network of um, network of temples in Luxor. And one of these festivals, a really wonderful one, is called the, the Beautiful Feast of the Valley, the valley, of course, being around the Luxor area. We know about this from about the year 2000, and it continues until about almost 300 BC. So a very, very popular festival, only in Luxor, not on from any place else, one time a year. And it's a time when the people from the east go over to the west, where most of the tombs are, and they celebrate with their deceased ancestors. And this is a wonderful, wonderful festival. It was focused here. So again, with this festival, you have the statues of the gods and the kings put on their boats, sail across the Nile this way, this time. And we have lots of texts about this. There were, there were actually lookouts who were designated on the West Bank. You know, it's like not that far away, but it's a ritual thing. And they start making all sorts of noise when they start seeing this huge flotilla of these sacred boats coming across the water. 
And then the statues of the kings and the gods are dragged through the necropolis. Now you've seen the West Bank. So they were going between all of these temples. Originally it was focused on this temple. This is that temple, the ruined temple by the Hatshepsut temple. So this was originally the focus of this festival. Another reason probably why Hatshepsut built hers next to it, because she wanted to kind of grab the attention in this temple. And in any case, this festival got bigger and bigger and bigger to the point where the boats wouldn't fit between the pillars of this temple anymore. So they had to, you know, instead of making a smaller thing, they just built a new temple. <laughs> and the whole idea of this, this idea of the West, is the West, as you know, is the land of dead. But Hathor, I'm sure you've heard the name Hathor before, is a very important deity in this. She's the god of love, <clears throat> dance, singing. She's called the Lady of Drunkenness. Mm. And her, her, her um, temples usually have a porch of drunkenness. It's like good old Hathor. But she's also very much associated with the West Bank. Here's Hathor. Remember we saw her as a, as a cow at the Hatshepsut temple? This is, these are the mountains behind that temple. And here Hathor is emerging from the western mountains. And so she's a very important feature in these festivals that unite living and dead in Luxor. So she was emerging from the land of regeneration. So we have information about these, about the route. For example, one of the first parts of it was, remember we saw these statues, that big, that big temple behind this? This was one of the first places that huge procession of, of uh, boats with the gods and the king went. We know it because there's an inscription on the remains of this temple, and it's called, uh, it refers to the temple as its beautiful name, which his majesty has given, is the name of this temple, receiving Amun and exalting his beauty. It is a resting place of the Lord of the gods in his festival of the valley in Amun's procession to the west to visit the gods of the west. So again, gives us the idea that they're visiting this specific temple, but the whole function is the gods of the east coming to, the, to visit the gods of the west. We also see this, for example, if you'll recognize this, this is the Karnak temple. This is that huge hole full of uh, columns. And very interesting because the inscriptions up here, if you remember, these are the ones that had a lot of color left on them. Yes. And these tell us that, in fact, this is a place that was also involved in this festival. Because it says that the, the ordinary people, not just the priests, can come into this part of the temple during this festival to adore the king and the gods. This is why we know a lot about these temples. Because if you start paying attention to these little inscriptions, it tell you, tells you exactly what they wanted to do with this. So as I mentioned, um, there were uh, graffiti, we have graffiti of the watchmen involved in this in this uh, festival that um, proclaimed the uh, approach of the flotilla. So the boats travel around the West Bank. They rested in the temple of the current king and other temples. And um, then finally, uh, they go to, Dar to the Hatshepsut temple where the whole thing spends the night. But uh, part of this, is, as I said, is Funerary. So what happens is the people who live on the East Bank go to the West Bank. The family tombs are there. And we know this is a time when they all wore like new clothes. A lot of interesting analogies with other religious festivals where you have to have nice, your best nice clothes on. And uh, they make a lot of noise, a lot of music, singing, dancing, because that was thought to awaken the dead and to, and to summon the spirits of your deceased ancestors. There's a lot of food involved, a lot of grilled meat because they thought that the odor would also uh, attract the dead spirits. And in part of this, this is a wonder, again, Egyptians love puns. So this is in the Feast of the Valley, this is a priest offering to the spirits of his dead parents. And he's giving, this is a big stylized flower bouquet. And the name for this bouquet in ancient Egyptian is Ankh. What else do you know Ankh means? Life. Life. So here, it, they, they love these puns, so giving them onk. And you see he's actually smelling the flowers, so again you have this thing, because they talk about the breath of life, you give people the breath of life, and here he's, he's inhaling the fragrance of the onk bouquet. So wonderful pun. Egyptians would think this is a real knee slapper, you know, it's like, really, they love jokes. And then the, the real focus of the Feast of the Valley is at night, uh, toward the end of the day, this whole procession of boats comes up, right where we were, up to the third terrace, 
And there, the boat of Amun spends the night with the goddess Hathor, who lives in that temple, and they have a wonderful time. And that union then recre essentially recreates the power of the gods. So that's really a lot of what this temple is about, is this sacred sexual union of uh, Amun and Hathor. And so, of course, that's why, remember when we were at this temple, you go up into the left, and there's this beautiful, what is now open air shrine, with all of these faces of the goddess Hathor? That's why that is there. A lot of Hathor uh, sim symbolism, a little hard to see, but this was on the wall as we first went in, with Hatshepsut, and here's the cow of Hathor. Do you remember this? Calling his wife a cow. Well, that, uh, I never heard that before. I've never heard that before. I think any Egyptian woman would be really offended if you called her a cow. I mean, it's like, well, maybe it's their family tradition. But, but this, this is pretty cool, with the, the cow of Hathor licking the hand of the queen. And uh, and the excavators, and things in the 1800s, nearby found this incredible shrine. They were just digging away and the whole front fell off it. And again, another Hathor, this beautiful scene of Hathor, a statue of the Cow of Hathor, wonderfully uh, painted decoration. This is from Thutmose III, remember the successor, Hutchinson. And this is very cool because it shows a scene that some of us noticed in the Hathor uh, chapel of the king, Thutmose III, drinking from the udder of Hathor, which sounds kind of gross. But again, it's this idea of, of the connection between the two. So the next day, the barks of the kings and the gods went back to their temples. They went, all went back to the east, east bank. Uh, the popularity of this festival explains also, this is the sanctuary. This is the, uh, the bedroom of the gods, literally the bedrooms of gods. But this whole procession, this annual procession, which is one of the biggest festivals in Luxor, explains the architecture. This is, this is, the, uh, this is Hatshepsut, looking back. So we parked, they've completely reorganized this. The parking lot was here. And some of you noticed when we got out of the buses to the left, there were these big mud brick yeah. gates. Those are part of these enormous tombs. All of these is just absolutely enormous tombs. Now in ancient Egypt, there was a zoning law that you could not put any tombs through here because this is that processional way. They wanted to keep it clear, but people really wanted to be associated with this. So many of us also noticed these tombs up here with, you know, it's prime real estate. They've got a perfect view eternally of this procession that goes through here. And so by about 600, um, the big wigs, the mayors of uh, this, this, one of these tombs is also the mayor of Thebes. A lot of these guys are mayors of Thebes. Um, we're, are building their tombs here and oriented to this causeway because of the importance of this particular festival. These festivals, as I mentioned, got bigger and bigger. But just like everything in Egypt got bigger, for example, remember the temples, the middle part is smaller and then the later part gets bigger and bigger and bigger. With Karnak, these festivals got so big and so wide, because the boats kept on getting bigger and bigger, they had to shave the, the bases off these columns. You'll see a lot of these columns that have the, the bases, the, the column bases shaved off, cut off, because they couldn't get the number of priests through that they wanted to get through. And these kings are constantly bragging about, I made, a, 15 poles, 15 carrying poles. My predecessors only had 12 carrying poles, and that refers to the size, size of the boat. So it's very interesting. You're constantly elaborating. But you, the architecture has to accommodate this, because of course, this is these temples are there because of those particular festivals. Well, people often ask, how long did these temples actually function? You know, they're still around 3,000 years later. We have some hints about, for example, at Dera Bakri again, a little bit more controlled oh, uh, balloon ride. So here we have Hatshepsut that we visited. Here is uh, part of Mentoka. And this is the ruined temple of her successor. And we have texts that talk about, it was functioning for probably about 150 years because we have priests who are still paid by the endowments of that temple to work in that temple. So we know it's still functioning. But probably shortly after that, it was destroyed by rock falls from the top of this cliff and it smashed this temple, so end of that temple. And in fact, it was pretty much forgotten until probably about 1950. 
when the Poles started excavating here, they had no idea that there was a separate temple in there. Other temples, for example, this is the Ramesseum, the temple of Ramses II that we drove by. Some, some of you are asking about roofing in the temples. Look at these roofing slabs. It's not wood, it's an enormous, enormous piece of sandstone. The Ramesseum, this temple, continued to function. It was built about, well, roughly 1300 BC, and it functioned for at least 200 years. And sometimes people just lost interest and they'd go to another temple. And often after people stop actually working in the temples, people start taking stones from it to rebuild other temples. We saw that, remember those two enormous statues we first stopped at? That temple behind it has disappeared because its foundations were undermined by bad planning. It was too close to the floodplain. And so when the walls started tipping and breaking, uh, a king who lived about 150 years later just took all the stone and built his own temple. It's much easier to do that than to quarry the stone. So these ritual connections are really not surprising. Um, and I think just as last thing I want to tell you about is the economic connections be between these temples. They were very strongly linked economically because they all are part of this, you know, LLC Amun. Because they're all part of this operation of the Amun. And Amun temples own a huge amount of land all over Egypt where they're growing the grain and raising the flocks and doing all this sort of stuff. So we know, for example, the Ramesseum, uh, another view of it, the thing that's extraordinary about this temple is it functioned like the Federal Reserve Bank. We drove right along this road. It's kind of hard to see. All of these are granaries. These are mud, brick, vaulted granaries. You know, for people who say the Egyptians could do vaults, well, huh? look at this. They can do vaults just fine. But this, this, as I said, was like a Federal Reserve Bank because these temples were going through enormous amounts of stuff each day. Because three times a day, they have ceremonies to feed the god. And after you feed the god, then the rest of it goes to the priest. Now, we have very explicit texts about this. For example, at Medina Kabu, the daily offering in that temple alone required 2,220 loaves of bread, 30 birds, 144 jars of beer, 100 bunches of various vegetables each day. So we're talking about a lot of stuff. The Ramesseum, these granaries, are thought to um, contain over 965 liters of grain and that was enough to, to feed something like 2,500 families a year. And of course, as they use the grain, it's constantly replenished. So there's a huge amount of stuff going on here. And what's going on is this temple is sending stuff to the East Bank, to Karnak. Medina and Habu is sending stuff to this temple. So it's a big interlinked economic system because this stuff all belongs to Amun. So it's being cashed and then sent out to whatever temple needs it. These temples were also big in other parts of the, the economy. For example, mining. You think about all the gold stuff these temples needed. Well, we have texts that talk about 10 mining expeditions jointly sponsored by the Karnak Temple, Medina Kabu, one of these other Oman temples, and another temple at Thebes, where they're going out and finding gold in Galena to help support all of this stuff these temples are doing. Um, we have texts about the farms and herds, one from the time of Amenhotep III, the guy who built the Luxor Temple. It talks about the herds of the temple are numerous, like sand on the shore. They have so many animals. And it's referring to the different ships and things that belong to the, uh, to the temple. So in conclusion, um, the incredible concentration of monuments and themes is not just an accident or it's like location, location. All of this has to do with this enormous um, economic and religious engine focusing on the god Amun. So the temples and shrines, these monuments that we saw on the east and the west were part of a very complex network of structures that supported the cult and economic domain of Amun, who's shown here, oops, that's not Amun, never mind, that's his, that's his son. Uh, but through, and also through the identity of the king as Amun, and Amun as the king, these temples really served as an enormous <coughs> stage set where the divinity of the king was proclaimed and the power of the god was also proclaimed. So thank you very much.
up. The, the, the temple to the left of Hatshepsut, if you're going to Hatshepsut, the one, you know, it seems kind of off to the side. Well, it was the first thing there, so he probably grabbed the most desirable location, and Hatshepsut was forced to. But, you know, it's, it's unfair, because his temple is very poorly preserved, and Hatshepsut is better preserved, so it's... But he clearly, he was the first guy there, so he grabbed the spot that was thought to be presumably yeah. most... Yeah, okay, the cruise does seem to be more centrally located, but again, it's kind of hard to tell without the whole thing. Also, by the way, this connection of, of her temple and her tomb, um, her tomb is direct is located directly behind her temple, but on the other side of the hills in the Valley of the Kings. How and why do these societies fail? How and why do societies fail? Boy, good question, good question. <laughs> There are a lot of sort of pat things we say in Egyptology. Um, probably, I mean, there are economic factors. For example, about the time these temples were built, uh, there was a huge rash of inflation and um, real economic problems. But the Egyptians came out of it. It was, you know, a couple hundred year recession. You know, it's like they came out of it. Probably the reason that this, uh, that this society finally disappeared um, is because of the religious system became so diluted and changed, first by the Greeks. The Greeks pretty much adapted to the Egyptian stuff. And the Romans sort of gave it lip service, but then the Romans insisted on um, the divinity of the king, which you think the Egyptians wouldn't have any trouble with. But it was just, it was not, so I think it has to do with um, the erosion of the power of the king and the erosion of the whole um, uh, religious system, but it's a really good question. You know, it's like, you know, ask, what's his name, uh, Jared Diamond? Is that the guy? Gun, yes. Jared, mm -hmm. You know, it's like, it, nobody really has a good explanation. But the thing that's very interesting is Egypt is one of the few countries you can think of where the geographic boundaries are essentially the same as they were 5,000 years ago. It's kind of, kind of odd. And so you could actually say, well, Egypt, didn't ever go away. Egypt just transformed itself. Because you do have different religion, you have different language. But um, it's it's not as if it just vanished. <coughs> because if, especially in, in Upper Egypt, in the Luxor area, um, the like straight line Muslim theologians really don't like what goes on there because there's a lot of folk tradition, a lot of folk tradition in Islam in Upper Egypt. And for example, remember the Luxor temple that we visited? There is an annual festival there. Remember that mosque you walked in? There's a huge mosque yes, yes. way up in the air. That's the mosque of a guy named Saint Abu Pagag. There is an annual festival of Abu Pagag, and guess what they do? They put up, they carry boats. The priests, the you know, the Muslim, the Muslim community, parades around that temple with boats on their shoulders. This does not go down well in Cairo. No, I'll put it that way. I mean, the people in Luxor are usually the butt of jokes of guys in Cairo, because Cairo is so much more sophisticated, and, you know. But Luxor has a lot of very, very interesting folk um, aspects clearly derived from the Pharaonic religion that have persisted in um, modern Islam. Why is there so much new So much destruction. So much movement, oh, oh, oh. At it? Yeah. Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, that is, the Poles were doing a really, really good job, but it's a tough job because they inherited a temple that was just basically it was like the jigsaw puzzle upstairs. You know, it was it was falling down. The problem was a whole lot of the pieces were there, so you. First, you have to make policy. What are you going to do? Do you only, re, you know, do you just conserve what's there and then just have these enormous blockyards um, and you build? You know, what What do you do? How do you present it? How do you preserve it first of all? And how do you present it? So these are two things which are sometimes contradictory. Uh, but what they ended up doing, they did a huge amount of restoration because they had so many blocks where they knew they belonged to the upper part of the walls. And so rather than just leave those in the block yard, you see a lot of walls that have a huge amount of modern stone, and that is done to support the ancient reliefs. 
So that's really the only way that they could help preserve those blocks, the ancient blocks, and also give people an idea of what this temple was. But it's, it's, a, lot of, it's a lot of restoration. It's a lot of concrete, a lot of concrete in that temple. Parthenon's the same way. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's a real philosophical question for the archaeologists. To what are they going to keep? To what point do you restore it? For example, I showed you a line drawing of a, of a palace at Medina Kabu. This is a big problem because there are two versions of the palace. Which one do you keep? Maybe just one more question. Yeah. That's what the uh, common people were doing. Were they all employed by the God? What were the common people doing? Yeah, it's, it's a very good question. And luckily, we know a lot about this from, from Luxor. Now, the farmers, we know basically nothing about, other than that they were farmers, because they don't leave an uh, archaeological record. But craftsmen, people like that, we know a lot about. And the pattern of life was, was kind of eerily familiar. It's basically, you've got the, the household in ancient Egypt was, was husband, wife, and children. They don't live with other big, like in the Muslim world, they don't live in extended families. So like, you, uh, in, ideally, boys go to school, they get married. Well, first of all, they get a job, then they get married, and they move to their own house. You know, they get it, they keep on working. It's, it, it's kind of bizarre, because it's, it's not unfamiliar to us at all. So the, the general people in Luxor, it was a lot of people were priests or priestesses, and this was a, sort of a, a very clever part on the economy because most priests and priestesses were what they call wedding. Uh, these are hourly priests. <laughs> They're part-time priests. <laughs> and so what, the way this works is the, the priesthood of a temple is divided into either four or five shifts. And each of those work for three months at a time. So you're working full-time for three months. And then you're off for nine months. And you go back, which means after you're a priest for three months, then you go back to your job as a um, working for the uh, civil service, doing something like that, working for the military, craftsman, maybe a manager of a farm, something like that. And this is also, I think it's very important to remember this because it's, many times people look at these temples and they go, oh, sense of mystery, nobody knew what was going on in these, but there were huge, huge numbers of people who were rotating in and out of these, these temples because at one point during the year, they would be on duty. They would have the requisite level of purity to be working throughout the temple. And I think people from the Greco-Roman background don't quite get this because they, they want to see Egyptian religion as a religion of mystery, where it was, you know, the great unwashed had no clue what was going on. I don't think that's at all what's going on because also you saw the temples yourself. You could see the reliefs on the outside of them. So even people who didn't want to go in the temple or couldn't go in the temple had a pretty good idea what was going on because the rituals are shown on the outside of the temple also. So um, people lived in mud, in mud brick houses. Some of uh, these mud brick houses could be two, three stories. Um, they would own flocks. They have little garden plots. Egyptians were terrible trash managers and bad, uh, uh, so usually little sort of crooked alleys and stuff like that. We know a lot about the daily life. Would their job have been to have a job to uh, yes, uh, so there, there are a lot of different professions, lots of different professions. Um, so there would be a builder. For example, if you're a craftsman, you would be very, very specialized. You would be the person who, for example, finished the statue rather than uh, forming the statue, or you'd be the person who would do the, the outline. Well, we saw in some cases how only two-dimensional on the reliefs, where they first do it in red, and then they correct it in black. Those are completely different craftsmen. So you've got it. It's kind of full employment is what's going on. The, the, and most of these guys are government employees, so that's why the, the government was such an important thing. Well, thank you very, very much.